So the next question is, can you relate this, I always talk about this resonance or this state, right? Can you relate that to a particle in a box? Because I sort of said, right, it's like a resonator and you put the, the wave in there and it's a hard wall, right? And we imagine we hop in from the left and the right and we hop out. That's kind of like coupling reservoirs on the left and the right to a, to a box, right? So can you relate these states to a particle in a box? So here's this transmission coefficient and here are these quasi-states that I mentioned here. And here we plot something we call the density of states. So a high value here in sort of a bluish would mean that is where electrons would like to be. And so here you see a S-like ground state and a P-like excited state with two lobes, right? And you see these funky waves bending up against the barriers here, over here. That's a standing wave bending up against the barriers. Okay? And these are bound states that are sitting here. Well, let's see if we can make this further concrete. So let me remind you of a particle in a box problem that you can solve, right? It's the time independent Schrodinger equation for the case where inside of the box you have zero potential and outside you have infinite potential, right? You've done this exercise, I'm sure. And you know what the solutions are. It's simple signs, right? Sine waves. Yes. And you also know that the energy levels are discrete, right? So you have a ground state, an excited state, next excited state, and so on. And note that the energies go as n square, right? Well, we can solve all of this, but I'm sure you've seen it. But the point is that the eigenenergies go as h, should be, let me see, h or h bar, should be h bar square pi square or 2 ml square n square. Okay, so if you pack together the pi over l and the n, like in this k, pi n pi l x, here's a k in that sign, it goes as k square, right? Because the underlying dispersion is a parabolic dispersion. And what you do is, out of that continuum dispersion, you discretize k. Okay? So the way you do that is you could draw a dispersion like this, a parabolic dispersion, and you pick discrete k's as pi over l, 2 pi over l, etc. Right? You pick it off and you could project it into that resonance on the left. Okay, so that you can do in this piecewise constant potential barrier lab, that's an output of there. And it can superpose what you do in the particle in a box type calculation compared to um, what you get out of the transmission coefficient. So in a case of a pretty thick barrier that is pretty tall and a well that's pretty long, you can sort of see the green and the red are close, green and red are close, and for higher and higher energy they're starting to deviate. Okay, but at least the ground state here, the lowest state in this box, the first two, you can explain with a particle in the box picture, which is sort of calming to your soul, right? It makes kind of sense. What is not calming is that for higher energies this thing really deviates. And remember in my opening lecture about open systems that I said uh, it's important to have self-energies that open a system up rather than a closed system? Goes to exactly that. An open system is different than a closed system. An open system feels the open boundary conditions. It feels and its eigenstates are different. Okay? And you can show it with very simple analytical expressions like that, that it's important. And that sort of goes into some of the harps I have about physics where a lot of the teaching is being done on closed equilibrium systems in physics on quantum mechanics. But as electrical engineers, we deal with open systems all the time. 
And quantum mechanical open systems behave differently than quantum mechanical closed systems. Okay? So the only thing we can argue is that the well region resembles a particle in a box problem. And we kind of have a little bit of an intuition what that means. But the numerical details are going to be radically different. And they're radically different if you actually consider devices that are more realistic. If you take a thinner barrier uh, with shorter barriers that are uh, reasonably size and length, you already see that they're strongly deviating from each other. Okay, so the, again, the red are the double barrier en energies like the, uh, that we see in the uh, numerical simulation of transmission coefficient, and the green ones would be the particle in the box calculations. So for this particle in a box, the energy separation you would compute is much larger than what you see in the open system. Now you might argue, why is that? So here's my intuitive answer, and it's not completely accurate. But you notice that the open system red lines are always under the closed system green lines. And the way I think about this is what you have is a, not a true oscillator anymore, but you have a damped oscillator. And a damped oscillator that has a finite lifetime, its eigenenergies are going to be below the true perfect resonator. Now, that falls a little short. It should be only lower by roughly the resonance line width this effect is much larger. And I think that has mostly to do with the exponential variation of the tunneling time through these barriers that varies as a function of energy. In a closed box, there is no tunneling time. That barrier is infinitely, per, uh, infinitely high. There is no coupling that is energy dependent. But these states that are higher and higher in energy see a softer and softer barrier, so to speak, versus the states that are low in energy see a strong barrier. That's why for a long well with fat barriers, there's good agreement because you have a lot of states that are sitting low surrounded by fat barriers. But if you make it more realistic, bring them closer, you push the states apart, they start to sample the gamma, the coupling constant to the barriers that is much larger. Okay. So we can make this more concrete here if we look at the uh, wave functions that are sitting here. So here's the ground state like wave function and you actually see that it penetrates a little bit into the barriers. Okay? And that kind of makes the box a little bit bigger, so to speak. Right? Because in an infinite well you would have said, well I, I set this to zero here, so you now say, well I make it set to zero a little bit further, so I make my box equivalently a little bigger. The problem with that is that that length, that decay length, depends on energy. So you would have to make your box uh, a little wider and at an angle or something, right? As an energy dependent angle. So the point is, an excited state actually penetrates deeper into the well, and a further excited state will uh, penetrate deeper yet, because the barrier gets more and more transparent, so to speak, as you go up in energy. That makes sense? Okay. So the key summary here is that that double barrier structures can show unity transmission for energies below the barrier height and you get resonant tunneling. Which is surprising, right? If you just had two classical barriers, like two resistors, you would double the resistance. Here, you actually have perfect transmission. It's like there is no resistance. Then resonances can be associated with quasi-bound states inside of the box. You can relate those with a particle in the box problem. A state has finite lifetime or resonance width. Increasing the barrier height and width increases the resonance lifetime, the electron resonance time, and it sharpens the resonance width. And um, if you make the structure asymmetric, you reduce the unity transmission to something less than unity. So, you guys have any questions? <laughs>